Hello, everyone. So welcome to our Tech Excellence Meetup. Our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. And these are some of our speakers for 2022. So we have quite a number of upcoming speakers. And uh, you can also join us of, on Meetup so that you can get notifications about our future events. Also, you can like uh, this video and subscribe uh, on YouTube and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And if you have any technical questions, feel free to also join the discussion on GitHub. So for today, I'm really excited that Ivan Polovich will be joining us to talk about clean architecture, uh, principles, patterns, and practices. And Ivan is an engineering manager at Lunar Bank. And as you probably already know, uh, Ivan has created uh, excellent templates regarding clean architecture, which are available on GitHub, and he's also been actively writing uh, about clean architecture, as well as uh, doing some YouTube videos uh, about it. So I think that this is a really great opportunity for us to learn uh, a lot. And the other benefit is that even is applying clean architecture in practice. So I think this is a great opportunity to get some like practical insights. So handing over to Ivan now. Thanks, Valentin. I really appreciate the invite and I really appreciate this group. I think it's uh, one of the best technical groups rising uh, in my network. I always uh, appreciate to see your uh, insights and also the insights for, uh, from this network of uh, developers that are always on the spot uh, regarding uh, tech excellence. And uh, yeah, today the talk is about clean architecture. It's something that I talked a few times before, uh, sometimes about focus on testing, others about domain-driven design, because I see some connection on that. And uh, I want to introduce you today uh, on the principles, the patterns, and the practices. Uh, and I'm going to characterize these three uh, things as a architecture style, something that to say, okay, this uh, code base has the look of a clean architecture. Oh, this code base has uh, some uh, uh, references to clean architecture. Some, uh, so I'm gonna talk about that. And just to start up, uh, my name is Ivan Polovich. I, I have been very active on GitHub, sharing some code, some uh, different approaches of uh, implementing clean architecture, sometimes event sourcing, other tools on, on clean architecture, some documentation, uh, and I really like it. Uh, there is uh, a lot of things that I've been sharing with you. And today's agenda, I have to start building a foundation of clean architecture. And that starts with hexagonal architecture style. What is that? What are the minimum, um, minimum characteristics of a hexagonal architecture style? Then going to clean architecture, what, what it adds up. Uh, testing strategies, some pitfalls. Uh, I've seen that you can always follow rules. And sometimes the rules are not uh, suitable for you, uh, for your project. Uh, and you might find issues and it's better to be aware of those. And at the end, we have key way and I'm really looking forward to that. So then getting started with uh, clean architecture, I have to Boom, uh, built a foundation on hexagonal architecture style. As a style, I am defining uh, some minimum sets 
uh, of um, activities that you have to perform. For instance, uh, on principle, hexagonal architecture style uh, as, uh, have the premise of a following dependence inversion principle. And that uh, we can, uh, I, I'm going to expand, uh, but this is the minimum. If you don't have dependence inversion principle, you might be doing something else other than hexagonal architecture style. The patterns, ports and adapters patterns. This is about uh, interfaces and components. And the practice that I also want to introduce is test-driven development. Uh, those three uh, activities and characteristics, for me, define hexagonal architecture style. Uh, starting with dependence inversion principle, uh, these are not uh, something that I came up with. Uh, I, I've seen uh, references from uh, Robert Martin, and uh, the definition are uh, as those here. Uh, we have models, uh, and some are high level, others are low level models. And those two kinds of uh, models uh, should uh, not depend on each other. They should depend on abstractions. This is what defines as a principle. So whenever you are this, uh, implementing uh, dependency between uh, different components, uh, you create this abstraction between. And this abstraction between uh, helps you uh, decouple those two models. Uh, but, but of course, dependency inversion principle helps you decouple the models. But somewhere else in your application, uh, you have to glue those models together. Uh, it's usually close to your application entry point. You, you can have uh, different approaches of that. But this is the idea of the principles. Uh, different components, they do not depend on each other, they depend on abstraction. Then, having the principle, you might uh, end up uh, in applying the pattern, ports and adapters pattern. What does it uh, tell us? The pattern is very much, uh, we have to first understand what are ports, what are adapters. Ports are the interfaces exposed by your core application. So uh, your application uh, might have the most usual of them, uh, gateways or repository interfaces. So your application needs a component that acts as a gateway to the database, gated gateway to the email notification, uh, gateway to uh, an external device. So uh, ports and adapters uh, tells you, look, your, your abstractions will go as part of your core and your components will depend on, on those uh, core interfaces, but they will be uh, a component that you enable and you can switch between those different implementations. And that's what I am uh, showing here. Uh, for instance, I have the notification uh, port and then, then the notification port have two kinds of uh, adapters, one in memory messaging and another email notification. You, you should design your application in a way that you can, uh, should be able to switch uh, between uh, those. So um, then, uh, just to expose a bit more about ports, um, ports are those interfaces uh, that are 
exposed by the core. They are highly abstract. And examples of uh, ports are use cases, signatures, uh, any required dependency like uh, notification, databases, uh, like like not, not really the database, but abstractions of the storages. And those are the ports, the simple interfaces that are exposed by the core application. Uh, so uh, these are examples here. So with simple interfaces like I account repository, the definition of it, and uh, we can we can see also the other examples like uh, out I output port, I deposit use case, and all of those are ports. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, adapters they implement those ports. They are highly concrete. They should be very specific. Let's say you have an adapter for uh, your database. There should not be new abstractions there, but in reality, the concrete implementation for the database. Um, there is, it is going to help you in the future uh, knowing uh, if your adapter is a primary or a secondary actor. Uh, this might see uh, like going too deep on the definition, but your adapters, they might be a driver. Let's say your user interface might be uh, an, adap uh, an adapter that invokes your use cases. Uh, on the other hand, like uh, your adapters for the notification, for the database, they are definitely secondary actors. They are being invoked by your core abstraction. Uh, so uh, this will help you uh, later on on design them. Some examples of uh, adapters are uh, the web application component, the unit tests, those are even uh, primary actors because they are invoking your use cases. And on the other side, there are data access implementations. Everything that executes IO uh, are secondary uh, actors. Uh, and other infrastructure components, let's say you, you might even have uh, um, a secondary actor for uh, validation, encryption, um, and uh, those are adapters also. So examples of adapters are the entire component that implements your interfaces. So the entirely package of implementations uh, that uh, give life to a uh, port uh, are the adapter. So uh, while the interface are simple interface, uh, uh, while the ports are simple interfaces, the adapters are components. Uh, a package, they, they should be also uh, packaged. So uh, it works like that. Uh, Showing that uh, in, in a different diagram, the uh, primary actors are your unit tests, your user interface, and your secondary actors are the infrastructure components uh, that are invoked by your core application. Um, there is one interesting thing uh, that I try to follow uh, but I, I don't want to be dogmatic here, but um, the interfaces that I expose on my application, I usually have two kinds of components. Let's say 
if my application expose a notification uh, so a notification service port, I usually have two implementations for that component. One that gives me the illusion of that component existing, and it's what I call a fake. And the other one that actually implements uh, that interface concretely and very specifically to that protocol, to, to that intent. So, and that allows us later on uh, a variety uh, of uh, tests. Um, so, at this point, we talked that hexagonal architecture are the principles, uh, dependency inversion, then uh, the pattern, uh, ports and adapter, but then you have to add your practice, and the practice is uh, test-driven development. The, uh, the practice of using the tests to guide the soft implementation. Uh, the TDD also boosts your confidence to change and deploy working software in production. And uh, the best is that it also works as a documentation and to communicate uh, the team, the intent uh, of the code base. Uh, the, the rules of uh, TDD, uh, those are uh, still from the uh, Robert Martin uh, website. Uh, it's about uh, you are not allowed to write any production code uh, unless uh, it makes a filing unit test pass. But I, I just want to put this uh, on this test driven development approach is that uh, it's not about writing the tests upfront, it's about writing a, a, a little bit of the test, then uh, implementing the production code. And the moment that that is uh, compiling, go back on your test and uh, implement the remaining part. And short this loop in, in a way that uh, the code that you write in production are the code needed to make your tests pass. Later on, you also expand it to uh, make the test optimal and also refactoring your code. Um, but anyway, uh, the, at this point, you have the principles, the patterns, and the practices. This, as a whole, sets you, OK, I am following a hexagonal architecture style. And uh, as a test-driven development, you, you should consider the red-green refactor. And uh, those are the, this tiny loop between writing the test uh, implementing the production code and uh, refactoring and shorting this uh, loop to the minimal that you can uh, make your life uh, better. Uh, but it's not as easy as it, it, it says. I, I understand. But at the end, uh, the style of, uh, or actually, the test-driven development practice should consider also what is the end result that you are aiming. And uh, I, I have to try to picture how it's on my mind uh, that the classes and components, they work and, and, and how they are being tested. For me, the use cases are kind of these entry points 
of this web of objects. So uh, a use case uh, should be as close as executing it as possible and as close as your user invoking that command and say, okay, I want to execute this. Uh, and having that in mind helps you also drive your tests. I think uh, it's, you can call it use case driven tests. Um, this helps very much your design. So you, you can have this entry point for your application. Um, the approach that I uh, follow, it, it's very much that the tests that they narrow to a use case and I am going to identify the expectations, uh, the neighbor classes and, and, and objects that are required for that uh, use case to run. I also have a, a style on my own, which is about when I find an expectation, I prioritize writing fake implementations of that. Uh, the, the components that you give me illusion of that external device um, and writing them as production code that I should, that I could enable uh, and start using uh, right away. Uh, just to uh, make a parallel with this approach. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of um, I am a .NET developer most of the time, and I, uh, I've seen very much approaches of prioritizing uh, mocks, uh, those components, uh, those kind of code that you write on your test uh, that um, implements the expected behavior, uh, but lives in your test suite. Uh, I am prioritizing not this approach. I am prioritizing the approach of uh, if I need a component to run my use case, I should prioritize implementing a fake implementation for that. Uh, that very much aims the design that I want at the end, which is having a component uh, that runs in memory and another later on a component uh, that is very concrete and specific and do the real thing. Uh, but that's the design for testing that I want to approach here. Um, the first test that I implement, they would aim some use case. They will reveal to me what are the expectations and those expectations will become fake components. Um, it's, uh, it is so fantastic that later on, my application will start walking itself without even knowing uh, the existing of the database or uh, any external uh, protocol that my application needs. It can be uh, tested and it can run in production uh, like, uh, like it works. And, and, and give us a short feedback. Uh, but in reality, uh, the, the timeline or, or the knowledge of what is our end result uh, can come uh, close to us. And it's very much possible that you know that you're going to use a, a SQL uh, database because that SQL database already exists and uh, there are several tables already there and you just need to implement the queries that write uh, where you want it to be and read from where you want it to read. So then later on, I switch my focus on designing against the use case to design against uh, the real component. And, and in that case, I, I can uh, write tests for the reading uh, queries, then writing tests for the writing operations. Uh, but that is how I see. Then the test starts to be the user 
of those components, and I can very much design and implement uh, those components in isolation uh, with certain level of dependency uh, to my core application, but the dependency will be to the abstractions of those uh, components. Well, uh, at this point, I've been talking about hexagonal architecture style. And hexagonal architecture style will define those principles, dependency inversion, ports and adapters, and TDD. Uh, clean architecture will, will also follow those, but add uh, some uh, spice to it, actually. So then uh, clean architecture style, on my view of uh, experience, should follow the stable dependency principles and the stable abstractions principle. Then, as a pattern, the use case should be a central organizing structure. What is this? Uh, uh, it, it is really uh, putting the use case as a first class citizen in your core domain. So you design to support use case, not the opposite. And uh, something that I've seen mentioned in man many places is that uh, the user interface, it's also a component. It's a, also a primary actor, and that also should be pluggable uh, to your core domain. So, uh, and, and that is also important. Y your application uh, can start as a console application that you input some text and it executes your use cases and gives you the valid uh, result. And uh, later on, you, you see that, okay, this needs to be a real web application or just a, a API uh, that you have to implement, and then you switch. Um, there is a, a like a starting point of uh, clean architecture style uh, from Uncle Bob that he aggregates different uh, architecture styles and say, okay, uh, this also can be uh, aggregated as a clean architecture style. He he doesn't do this uh, foundation of uh, hexagonal architecture style to clean architecture style, but I'm interpreting uh, that all of those uh, produce systems that are independent of frameworks, they are testable, independent of UI, independent of database, in, independent of any external agency. Um, so, the trick here is also independent of UI. Uh, so that's why, why I think uh, about a pluggable user interface. And then I have to uh, dive into the principles. I, I'm going to uh, talk to you about those differences, the principles that we add as clean architecture and, uh, and also the patterns. So, on the principles, uh, the stable uh, abstractions principle is about the level of abstraction uh, in your component also increases with the level of stability of your component. Um, I think we, we just have to uh, understand what is abstraction and what is uh, what is high abstraction and what is lo low abstraction. So uh, an interface is very much abstract. It, it just defines uh, a behavior of uh, um, a signature. Uh, on the other hand, uh, implementation of that interface is very much concrete. It's very specific, probably has even dependencies. Um, the idea of uh, the abstractness increasing with stability 
is that uh, your components in general became more abstract as much as it became stable. And uh, also the models around it will depend on the direction of the stability. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if you have uh, entities as the very much your domain as the very core, the most abstract uh, structure, uh, it shouldn't have dependencies at all, right? So it should have, it should be very abstract, also stable. Uh, but I also am going to uh, demonstrate it. Uh, what is this about? Also, uh, some the classes that chain together are packaged together. Uh, that is related to uh, how you package your components. Um, regarding abstractness. Uh, stability and consistent. Uh, le let's just think like that. Uh, the more external to your application, uh, let's say the, the green part here, the more it should be very specific. If you have a web adapter, it should know about the web. It should know about uh, JavaScript, HTML, and uh, REST, for instance. Uh, the database also as an external, uh, external component should know about the uh, database provider protocol and, and, and uh, web clients also should know about uh, all the protocols, REST or uh, gRPC or whatever. On the other hand, the more abstract, the more stable it becomes because it has less dependencies than the controllers. Okay, your controllers uh, might uh, depend on a few use cases. Uh, your presenters give uh, the behavior that your use case expects from the user interface and the gateways uh, and, and so on until you reach the entities that should be totally independent, very abstract, and also very consistent. They, they should be uh, very, very consistent. Um, about stability as a single uh, chart here, you, you can see that the blue component, it's stable uh, because it doesn't have any dependency uh, that is it is required, uh, but it's this also component is is very responsible for several components uh, that are depending on it. Uh, later on, you can have other kind of component like a very unstable component uh, that depends on several uh, dependencies. So uh, those two, they are very different and they should be placed in different uh, sides of your application. And there are the pitfalls, let's uh, just to get started. So suppose your domain is your central uh, component is very abstract and, and gives you, and, and everything depends on it, right? And if you want to depend on something, you probably want to depend on something that is stable, right? I think that's a rule for life. You, you don't want to depend on someone or something that is unstable. It, it creates a mess on the ones uh, that depend on it. But the first pitfall that I've seen in many cases is to add shiny frameworks and shiny libraries to the domain because then the domain becomes unstable. And if you have an unstable component as dependency of everything else, that instability 
and rigidity will propagate uh, everywhere. So because then uh, those components will become more unstable than it should. Um, I also want to talk about the use cases uh, as a central organizing structure. And uh, that is, at first, there is uh, the first, uh, let's say, rule that I would say is that your use case should be as clear as possible in your core domain. It, it should say, OK, my application does this. And you can separate them in folders or single files that, uh, listing uh, what they do. But they should be split saying, OK, when I open this core application, I know what this application uh, intent is. Uh, those use cases should be the application entry point. Uh, it should be easy to uh, invoke them uh, with simple uh, messaging. And uh, I have some examples here is that the use cases, they, they really uh, should show the intent of the system. They should be delivery independent. They, they shouldn't be uh, dependent on, on concrete implementations like a database or other systems. They should be treated as really algorithms that interpret the input to generate some output data. Um, you, you can even have these uh, use case diagrams for your system, like the, what the primary actors are invoking and what are the use cases invoking uh, as a side effect. Well, uh, and that is the example of the separation here. It's like uh, the user interface would live on a layer that is more concrete. The user interface should know exactly how to display that user interface, even if it is a console application, a web layer, or an API. Um, they are, by definition, unstable. So uh, changes on, on your core would uh, require changes in your user interface. But this is, by definition, they should be. That's what you expect. You don't want the opposite, that changes in your interface uh, requires changes in, in your uh, use case implementation. So they are uh, inconsistent. They, they should uh, reflect um, because the, the validation, uh, you, you might implement validation of the data that you display or that you get from the user, but the real consistency of the data will be on the core layer and from there forward. Uh, another uh, description of, uh, of another, another example of use cases are those uh, like folders here that I am, uh, that I got from my uh, template that showing, okay, the use cases are here. I can see the list of them. And uh, my use cases, they have this use case name. And uh, they are this kind of algorithm that uh, executes a deposit. And there is something interesting that I adopt on, on my uh, use case. And, and usually on, on most of my applications is to have a presenter and or to design my core domain expecting the existence of a presenter later on, something that will uh, display uh, that information to the user. That also gives me uh, different ways of testing the application and different ways of uh, designing it. 
Um, yes, and another uh, point that I usually get is about pluggable user interface. Uh, so it is about uh, having your core abstractions uh, to be the same, even if your application runs on a web server or in a console uh, terminal in text. Uh, and I even had different approaches on, on, I have an example called to do on my GitHub that I can switch between uh, running the application as a console that you write your text or running it as a web API. So the user interface should be really something that we enable uh, and the application behaves differently. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is uh, what I want to mention here. Uh, let's say this withdraw use case. I have this uh, uh, output port abstraction and one of the methods called this OK. So which means that after a successful withdrawal, I, I would expect my user interface to implement an OK call, say, OK, if, the, if it is a successful, I'm going to give you uh, the debt transaction and the debt account information. And the interface uh, should just implement on how to display that. But also uh, the edge cases, like uh, what if there are, uh, if the user is out of funds? OK, when that use case is invoked, uh, if it, the customer do not have funds, it will invoke this method. And the implementation of how to display that is a concern for the UI. Um, and this is, for me, a way of uh, driving the implementation of the uh, user interface on the opposite, because it's very much, uh, I've seen the, the different. It's like the uh, user interface defining uh, how to invoke and later on defining how to display it, but the, uh, and usually displaying it um, with several rules on, on that case. Uh, but I want the uh, interface to follow this strict contract, okay? In, in case of a success, that's it. You have this information. Um, and uh, this is a, an example of an implementation of a presenter. In, in that case, I have uh, the, the controller itself implementing uh, that I output port, and it has here uh, implementations of how to generate uh, the view uh, model that is going to be displayed to the user. So this is very much .NET. That is a different ways of uh, achieving the same result. Uh, but this is the way uh, it kind of works for me. Uh, I, I keep uh, this uh, view model uh, variable as a private variable on the controller. And those methods, they are invoked by the use case when appropriate. And uh, the API only needs to uh, uh, return that view model as a response. Uh, you you should actually check out like this. It's like the use case, I set the output port to the controller itself. I invoke the use case. And the, then later on, the use case will invoke uh, before the return uh, one of those uh, uh, callbacks. And 
by by consequence the wheel model will be set well um as a clean architecture style you also should be aware of your different testing strategies because uh tdd itself who will not give you that the tdd have the loop uh, of uh, the cycle of uh, how to interact with testing and production code but you also have to build your own testing strategy and in in that case excuse me and in in that case uh i want you just to picture in, in our minds uh, what is uh, how a typical software structure look like so in in, in these many boxes here i know there are many many boxes uh, what we have we have on the external sides we have a single page application which is something uh, that is getting the input of the user and invoking some use case then the application itself is split in, in several domain and several models controllers use cases uh, domain abstractions and on the right side the dependencies uh, and and those dependencies are external so uh, going to the database going to external apis and you should also have this in mind because if you don't know how the software look like uh, how many software look like it is very hard to design a totally uh, new software without having that in consideration so uh, another example going further is like uh, your application uh, could have a user interface uh, then use cases implementations and then this cross-cutting uh, uh, services that support the use cases uh, in giving the illusion or really going against uh, the external dependencies so uh, in this case there is like uh, you, you depend on exchange service and you might have the in-memory or an exchange rates API implementation. Um, having that in mind on the typical software architecture, you also can design uh, different uh, kinds of tests. And the first one that I would say is to have unity tests. Unity tests for me, they should be uh, very low input output they should be fast as uh, as lightning and they should uh, not run any kind of uh, external uh, service or go to a very minimal uh, i know that there are cases and cases but for me unit test low io fast and uh, for me the unit tests they should uh, target your use cases the application entry points so that will help you uh, design the core of your system and everything that it is needed you create fake implementations for it uh, an example of a uh, unit test here is that i have my fake uh, presenter i uh, pass it as an argument uh, to my use case on the set output port then i execute my use case and uh, i verify that my fake presenter have the information on the credit account so this is very much about uh, designing your algorithms uh, from the unit tests. Later on, 
you you might want to um, expose your application to the user. Uh, if your application is a, a API, uh, your user might be just a REST call. Um, there are different uh, user interfaces and, and, and different kinds of tests for component tests. But for me, what define a component test is that uh, they look like unit tests because you are testing it as an application as a whole, but uh, using fake implementations of any of your external services. Uh, that is when it starts to pay off uh, writing fakes, because you actually can put that application in production, and your fakes, they run as these tiny machines that uh, will give you uh, uh, the illusion of those dependencies running. Um, so uh, one trick or one benefit of that is that I usually have on, on my uh, test suite a uh, feature flag, okay, enable this uh, dependency like database or an external API. But if I say no, uh, the behavior that I expect is that uh, it is going to use an in-memory implementation, something that doesn't really go against the real thing, but gives me a good enough uh, way of testing it. Uh, yes, uh, so component tests really uh, execute uh, from the user or as close as possible from the user, in that case, making REST calls and asserting uh, and parsing uh, the result uh, into meaningful objects. Uh, later on, you should consider integration tests. And those integration tests is not like testing the whole application integrated with all the dependencies. That's not the case. It's about uh, creating a test suite uh, that helps you design the concrete implementation of those dependencies and testing them as um, as isolation as possible from everything else. And ideally, uh, each of your dependencies should be tested independently. So you shouldn't have like chain of dependencies being uh, tested. Um, yes, in, in my case here, I, I, I needed uh, to test uh, the exchange rate uh, service. And uh, what I do is actually uh, testing uh, that service and running it and uh, calling to convert and getting the result back. Um, and later on, you should have this end-to-end test. And those entrant tests should be the very minimum of your application because uh, yes, they are expensive, expensive to run in terms of uh, time, uh, and they are also uh, flaky. Uh, they they depend on external data. You might have to uh, seed the data uh, to the state that you can test or write the tests in a way that they can run multiple times. Uh, but uh, you also should have very few of them. Uh, but in that case, you are testing from the user perspective, the whole thing. Uh, and going back to that settings that I, I mentioned on my test, in that case, I should enable the, the feature to true and actually use a real database connection uh, and uh, use those services as close as possible to the real thing. Uh, then uh, your test will be as simple as just invoking it. You, 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 it's very easy to test the reading operations uh, because you, you, you probably have an initial state that you can query. You are not testing if all the rules are correct. You are just testing if the components can work together if those uh, initial configurations, if you can uh, set up the ports and components. 
Yes, and uh, different kinds of applications would require to focus on different kinds of tests. So um, if your application uh, has complex use cases and you also have to discover how uh, the use case look like, you might have to start with unit tests. Um, other kinds of applications, you have a weirdo protocol, a unusual uh, service that you have to start using and you might want to uh, write tests, integration tests against those. Well, component tests are usually when you want to uh, define the contract. Uh, you, you might have to uh, start defining a contract because another squad will uh, use that uh, soon enough. So uh, you might have to do that. And I wouldn't write end-to-end -end tests as a starting point. Uh, I, I haven't found that case. Um, yeah, tests should be short as possible. Um, the, uh, the assertion should be sh short as possible. Uh, you should have on only a single unit test. My uh, experience, mocks are less valuable than fakes because mocks, uh, they leave and they are totally implemented on the test component. Uh, they cannot run in production. Uh, and they really make it difficult to have this different testing strategy because at some point you might uh, be repeating your uh, mocks and, and, and spies and, and in different places. Um, to, to just to emphasize something that I mentioned before, test-driven test development is not about writing the whole test first and then the production code is uh, write uh, a little bit of the test, then write a piece of the production code, and then go back and, and start it uh, iterating. I also wanted to mention um, some pitfalls that I faced um, with clean architecture, because as everything in life, you have rules, uh, but if you follow all of the rules, you might uh, not end up in a good place. Or you should at least be aware by following the rules, you have this uh, kind of life. And uh, one thing about clean architecture is that all this practice, when you talk about principles, patterns, and practice, uh, the developer needs to have a background. And it's hard to uh, learn the overall structure. It's hard to decouple from the frameworks that we are used to have. Uh, it's hard to uh, find uh, the implementations that are better other than the ones that the frameworks sell you to use. So, uh, and it's also hard to build uh, uh, a group of developers that can support that. Um, it worked for me uh, in, in many places to actually dedicate to have this unicorn project that really reflects many of those principles. Um, they are usually very important projects and the other projects kind of uh, follow some uh, similar characteristics. And they usually, um, uh, by looking at those unicorn projects, you can uh, like, okay, let's think about the solution in a different way and get inspiration. Well, clean architecture might bring uh, too much uh, of a boilerplate. You, you have to have lots of public interfaces, all these uh, fake components um, might, uh, they look like a waste of time because when you mock them, you, you never want to uh, look at it. But when they are as fake in your production code, you say, okay, what is this? Uh, so you, then you start reflecting the weight of writing tests. So um, they might bring boilerplate. Uh, validation 
and some common frameworks, they uh, might uh, remove uh, those kinds of codes. So uh, yeah, clean architecture might bring uh, too much uh, of a boilerplate. Uh, another thing that I learned and uh, I've seen is that the moment your uh, clean architecture implementation gets more mature, mature, uh, you you must you might start creating these light frameworks to support your application because then you say okay uh, this kind of class or this kind of behavior I repeat uh, in in many places then you uh, abstract that and encapsulate and create some common behavior um, but what I see is that those light frameworks they are born from the need that you find in your application not the opposite it's not like uh, actually what i want to say is that those light frameworks they are born from the need that you find in your application um exception handling uh you you should have like uh only uh, ideally you, your exception should focus on io things like if the database is not uh, reachable uh, or any file system is not reachable if the uh, so things that are out of control of the algorithms uh, and and those are the uh, exception handling that i have uh, yes validation without frameworks are kind of painful to maintain if you have to validate uh, case sensitive length of uh, strings and range of types kind of uh, a pain uh, I found that fluent validation does a very good job, but even though I, I can use fluent validation as an adapter to my uh, to my application, so uh, if I need to validate something, I probably have a I validation service uh, de uh, declared somewhere, and for each type I implement it in my uh, my adapter, and in that case I implement that validation using fluent validation other things that i learned is that uh, having low code or no code at all uh, just this uh, applications guided by behaviors of or by libraries is not really clean architecture i think having less code doesn't mean clean architecture because if you match with the principles about uh, stability, uh, abstraction, and uh, the practice, they really don't match. So having no code is not really clean. It's another thing. It might be very good in, in, in different applications, but they're not clean architecture as the style that we recognize. Uh, yes, and uh, getting to the end of it, uh, I also wanted to uh, talk about the Clean Architecture Manga project uh, that I'm quite proud of, and I show many ways. Some things are good here, some things are uh, not that shiny, but uh, I hope you uh, find something useful. All right. Wow. This was a, a really a great presentation and it was nice how you covered both the concepts and also some practical examples. So since we have several questions, uh, we can now uh, go on to the questions. So can you give us some examples for stable dependencies principle and for stable abstraction principle? Yes, I, I think the, the begin it's how to violate those principles uh, because um, you prop you probably have in your application classes uh, that everyone depends on uh, usually those kind of classes and components uh, should be highly abstract uh, in, in a way that they should be mostly interfaces uh, simple plain classes and 
if you add a dependency there, like a, a shiny library, then your base classes became unstable and they also became concrete. If you add a dependency to a SQL server or to any other library, uh, it breaks the dependency principle because everything else in your application is, is depending on an unstable and concrete uh, component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's good. Like, th th so thanks for those uh, examples. We also had um, this comment, uh, pluggable user interface is okay for embedded UI in heavy client. More conventional front ends have their own clean architecture. So here, I think it's referring to essentially implementing clean architecture on like the React side as well. So uh, interested to hear your uh, perspective on this as well. Um, yes, if you are talking about uh, rich user interfaces, they are the application as a whole, and they might have its own ways of implementing a clean architecture there. Um, I, am, I was referencing uh, the presenter as a pluggable interface that you add to your server side, something that you can switch between running it as a console or running it as a web API or uh, other ways, or even putting a file and, and that file is processed uh, as an entry point for your application. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And I guess even what you've showed, it, uh, it reflects Uncle Bob's original image because when he drew it, it was essentially probably a monolithic application, maybe also inspired by desktop. And that's, that, that could, that's another, I guess, factor. Um, the next one, uh, how, when do you decide on the rules to apply on your fakes? For example, what errors to raise when the data is not found? Do you test your fakes? Do you test your real adapter with the same tests of the fake? Um, I, I don't test my uh, fakes with the same uh, energy level that I spend uh, testing them uh, concretely later on. Because when I am designing the fakes, I am testing the use cases. Um, and the use cases should perform as an algorithm as the uh, fakes gives me a normal implementation of it, like the happy path. Later on, I would test the concrete implementations and, and, and target them as uh, the real implementations. And, and in that case, I might test for uh, network unavailable, retry logic, uh, and those real implementations should perform correctly. Okay, so if I understood it correctly, since uh, you're testing the use case, one could say that the fake is transitively covered. I mean, the execution of the fake is already uh, transitively covered by the uh, use case test. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a debatable topic because some people take the approach to test uh, fakes and then also to have the same test later for real adapters, whereas some other people say, well, no, I'm not writing any tests for the fakes. They are transitively covered by the... Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. testing the, the fakes would enforce the structure in your tests. And, and that's uh, not really... The, like, it's not uh, my, my real intent. It, it's It's really unit tests against the use cases and transitively the fakes will be validate as working uh, but it's mostly happy path execution uh, because they will give me whatever I implement there and, and they are kind of part of the test. If you just invert the logic, if I write mocks, I, I shouldn't 
uh, test my mocks uh, if I because they are the part of the test itself. So uh, I think you should end somewhere. <laughs> it's like uh, not over. Yeah, I guess it's an interesting test. topic, uh, uh, especially with fakes since they might have logic and then it's like then there could be arguments for for testing but it is yeah. definitely a debatable topic uh the next question set output port is used for production code or for testing purposes well for both uh my controllers uh they always set output port to itself and my tests they uh, usually set output port to an in-memory presenter that I can assert uh, right away later on. But yeah, I use for both. Okay, great. Uh, we also had another comment. One second, I just need to. Apologies. Yes. Yes, I. Uh, let me know if you can uh, see me. Yes, I can see you. <laughs> okay, uh, okay yeah, I'll try was... again. Uh, just the click. Okay, I think it works now. Oh, yeah, the, I uh, think the yeah, inventor yes. is probably set in the controller, for example, but generally we just inject it in the use case uh, constructor. So, what's your approach there? Uh, yes, I, I think he uh, said uh, what I, I said uh, I mentioned previously is that I use uh, the set output port uh, as production code in the controller, and I also use the set output port in the tests, uh, setting to a fake uh, presenter. Uh, I mm -hmm. very much agree with here with Pierre. Okay. Uh, where do you define the routing for controller methods? Well, the, the routing is part of the web uh, API layer. So uh, you can use the framework that we are using in your web API layer. And in my case, our annotations uh, on the controllers. So you, you should use uh, the benefit of your Web API uh, framework that you, in the language that you are using. Yes, yes, it's definitely uh, dependent on on the actual web framework and not really constrained by clean architecture itself. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between a controller and a presenter? Yeah, so uh, they can be uh, the same class that performing the two responsibilities, uh, but ideally the controller, uh, you you could uh, you could you could have a single controller uh, in your user interface layer that uh, maps the requests to use cases, but uh, displaying it, uh, it's delegated to the presenter and the presenter is more like i want to generate uh how the user is going to see that uh, and it, it might need to uh, massage the data and, and put the fields and and uh, information uh easy to render it to uh to the user uh, but controller is about routing and presenter is about uh, displaying it. Uh, it's very common to have both uh, as the same class, but you can separate. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and I also have some questions from my side. So I noticed, uh, I mean, well, there's basically two major approaches. One is using uh, those input and uh, output ports which are injected into the use case so that's one approach now the other uh, approach 
I'm not sure if you've, if you've uh, looked at it or used it, is to accept requests and return responses. And in that case, there's no presenter, but instead the uh, Crest API simply, uh, you know, calls some pipeline mechanism, passes in the request, it gets a uh, uh, response. So I'm interested in your perspectives on, on that and how did you choose, for example, the usage of the input and output ports and uh, presenters compared to um, just using request uh, response and also taking into consideration the fact that, uh, well, I guess many service side applications that we're making now are pretty much um, REST APIs. Um, so I, I think just to focus here would be that you can have an approach of having your use cases return the result and that result is interpreted by the caller, in that case, the controller. Yes. Uh, and, and then they display it in different ways. If it is a not found, uh, the resource, the resource doesn't exist. If it is out of funds, because the response gives you that and tells you what to uh, render in that case. Um, so th the problem with that, that I've seen, is when you have this totally uh, different al alternate outputs. Uh, you, you can have an execution and give uh, success. In, in that case, success means uh, render the account and the balance and the transactions. Uh, and others is if there is uh, out, out of funds, uh, block the account or something like that is, is displayed. Uh, for me, the presenters helps defining all these al alternated uh, results that you might have. Um, there are other approaches like you, you can, I'm, I'm not sure if the pattern is called monads, when you have uh, generic uh, result and uh, the, uh, let's say, it can return the success or a failure uh, of your uh, use case. Both approaches are, are valid. For me, the, the presenter declaration tells more about the alternate scenarios than when it's uh, using the return because the return you have to uh, interpret it. Uh, mm -hmm. Like writing, for example, if else statements or something like that, if you're yes, you... having to interpret. And uh, I mean, there's also another uh, variation which also exists, which is handling exceptions, such as, for example, insufficient funds. So one way is via the presenter, okay, uh, it would then be in your interface as you showed, you know, for example, insufficient funds. If someone was doing request response approach, then uh, without any exceptions, then within the response, they would have success versus error response. And that could be one of the errors. And the last also approach is request response, but where the response is just for success, but someone could throw for that as an exception but again that would then need to be interpreted by the presenter if the presenter for example pattern is, is yeah. not used yeah yeah so i would say that the presenter approach declares in statements the alternate scenarios there are no usage of exceptions in that case uh, mm -hmm. you 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 can have a let's say, um, maybe a shared output that is only for validation. So you can even minimize uh, the, the boilerplate around the presenters. Uh, but for me, the, the critical uh, benefit is about declaring uh, the alternate scenarios because I would prefer to not use exceptions for um, these algorithms. Uh, I would 
I have used it uh, before, uh, but uh, currently I would prevent or minimize the use of exceptions only for uh, I/O operations uh, like uh, databases and uh, networking. Mm -hmm. Not not using, for example, uh, exceptions for more business logic areas like, like validation. Okay. We also have another interesting comment here. According to validation, you said you would create an abstraction and have it implement specific methods to test the types. Could you give a specific example? Um, yes. Um, for me, validation is as a service as any other thing. Uh, so, uh, and, and validation uh, can have a contract let's say validate the deposit input object so uh, which means that you you can have a uh, an interface called validation with uh, validate the deposit class and that is implemented uh, as an adapter uh, that you, you and in that case, you can use any framework that you want. Uh, in that case, could be fluent validation. And by by implementing that method, uh, validate the deposit input, you could return uh, an array of strings and, and a response object. I, I use that very much on the clean architecture manga. Uh, I have this validation class and uh, all the validate methods return a uh, notification uh, uh, object, and this ob uh, this notification object is enriched with uh, validation errors. Uh, so I can validate as many times as I want the different objects, and the end result is that I have the validation of all of them and I only continue the use case if there are no valid, uh, if everything is consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay, another also question, since that's, I guess, two options regarding uh, yeah. that one as well. Uh, one is that validation logic is executed in the pipeline before we even get to the use case. So for example, if someone uses mediator from Jimmy Bogart or something like that, that's the kind of, I guess, I think it was his name, uh, uh, approach. Um, versus the other approach, which is that in the use case that you inject the validator interface and then the use case calls dot validate. Which approach are you uh, currently using and why? Yes, uh, I, I would say that um, the, the thing about uh, Mediator it it that it is a framework and as a framework it uh, it influences how you design your application and it 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 is very extensible. You you can build pipelines, add the validation logic, and have a central uh, validation point, uh, but it very much influences how the application is designed later on. So for me, it, it breaks the clean architecture principle. So uh, I would not use because of that, uh, by breaking the principle. If it is uh, for everyone, I don't know, uh, but it it is another thing other than clean architecture. Um, but later on, uh, actually, what I use is to invoke the validate within the use case. And that validate is implemented somewhere else. And I enforce that my validate returns a, a standard object that has a is valid property. And if not, it has a collection of messages. And so I can invoke many validate methods as part of the use case, uh, but without having the implementation there. Uh, and by using this common abstraction, 
I can continue the execution of the use case or not. Um, but anyway, that adds some boilerplate. Later on, you can say, okay, maybe I should uh, have a base use case that invokes auto validates. Yeah, that might be another solution that emerges from your application uh, uh, with time. Uh, but you you can see that those would be uh, designed by uh, the need from the application, not the opposite. You, you shouldn't design your application because of the frameworks are telling you to implement that way. Mm -hmm. And another just follow-up question on, on that one is uh, when you uh, do, so you mentioned you have some interface for the validation, you can implement that somewhere, anywhere, somewhere else using, for example, Fluent validation. Now, the, uh, the part where you mention where you actually implement it with Fluent validation, which layer do you put that in? Yes, uh, uh, I usually have infrastructure dot validation component. And there I add uh, a dependency to uh, Fluent uh, validation. And uh, this class uh, implements the validation for these several objects. And the difference is that the return of those methods uh, is, a, is an object uh, that I uh, design my application against to. So it's a common object that has a is valid property. And if not, it has a, a list of uh, messages and, and error messages. Uh, mm. So the, the validation for me lives in the infrastructure because it could also be uh, living in the web API or, or, the, or the user interface layer. But that you, you can't really uh, trust because you, you might have validations being invoked by the use case algorithms also. So uh, there, are, there are validation that depends on the input itself, on the data itself, but there is a second level of validation that should consider external sources. So uh, I would have them in the infrastructure layer that you can test it somehow also. Uh, maybe it's it's going to be part of a, a integration test against those validations. That's mm -hmm. also a bit of a next level test, uh, I would say. Okay, great point. And we also have uh, this question, in your experience, how to enforce clean architecture or any other good practice across a team of not very experienced developers? just hire better people or well no i i think uh, uh we always learn with each other even by implementing clean architecture the best way you're going to find many many issues that you have to solve well the approach that have worked for me is, is really to have some unicorn projects as a unicorn i'd say like these projects that are really shining and, and have relevance to the organization. They are well designed and well implemented and the other applications get inspired by. I would say that is not really a template, but an application that you are really proud of that uh, uses those uh, benefits. And in the age of microservices, let's say now we, that we create uh, applications uh, very frequently, you can always point to that application and say, okay, this shows something. Uh, and there are many solutions. And that's also one approach that I created, Clean Architecture Manga, which is it's not really a template. It's not like you can start your application from there. It's more like showing uh, solutions uh, that I use it. And you shouldn't use all of them, uh, but you, you can select the ones that uh, work uh, for your case. Yeah, definitely. So having some kind of um, reference implementation, you know, a real living project which serves as a reference implementation is probably what's most effective. 
Yeah, uh, but continuing on that. Uh, Might be that templates, I... but templates are less effective compared to, um, I guess, this. Yes, and continuing on that, uh, enforcing is, is, is different than building it. Uh, what have worked for me is actually to build a foundation on solid principles, uh, domain-driven design, clean architecture, uh, and working close together. And uh, the, the application itself is just a result of it, but it's, it's really about uh, building a strong relationship with the team uh, to understand each other, care about the project. Um, uh, I actually feel like Clean architecture is just the result. It, it's the way you work. It, it, that's the what matters, actually. Yes, and what matters more might even be the motivation of people to learn rather than experienced. We could have experienced developers who are not, for example, interested or who reject uh, the possibility of, of learning um, something new. Uh, a follow-up uh, a point here is uh, I'm working in a single code base team, unfortunately. Is there any solution to that situation? Well, I've seen uh, that a few times. And well, I, uh, I had this uh, huge monolith with uh, several dependencies to uh, libraries and frameworks. Um, we started with applying solid, the plain and simple solid, uh, using uh, applying dependency inversion principle, extracting components, testing them in isolation, and working on a single code base is actually better today, I would say, because you, you can really uh, evolve it uh, and, and make it better. Because with microservices nowadays, most applications after being deployed, they are just on, uh, on, on a short maintenance. I think if you have a single code base, you, you might have uh, time to improve it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. And another possibility that, that can also be done is starting with hexagonal architecture first, because that, that is the essence. So firstly separate, you know, the internals of the of your application from um, infrastructure. So I like to use that as a first step. Whereas clean architecture, okay, goes to the next level about prescribing the layers um, um, inside. We also, I guess, management is a popular topic. So imagine how happy management would be if you introduce clean architecture into a not very experienced uh, development team so i think that this is something that many of us can uh relate to um because then management might say oh now you are slowing down when people are trying to uh learn something new i'm interested whether you ever uh, i guess had experience in these kind of uh, uh environments maybe where there isn't a possibility for learning and where uh, management would be not unhappy with people learning clean architecture? Well, um, you might have not really, not very experienced, but really with experienced people uh, and developers that just want to follow the framework's guidance on how to use that. And introducing clean architecture in those cases leads to many discussions. Oh, we have this framework. Uh, should we really depend on that? Or should we abstract on that as much as we can? Uh, uh, I think it's about choosing your battles. And uh, it, it is better to uh, certain kind of frameworks and libraries are easier to decouple. Start from there justify the reason from the principle is like dependency version principle uh pause and adapt the pattern later on you expand to the not very 
uh, usual libraries to decouple, I would say like mediator, how do you decouple mediator? There are ways. Mm -hmm. um, should you also? Uh, those are uh, battles that uh, you have to choose. I, I think at the end of the day is about creating a environment that everyone cares, that everyone cares about each other, about the project, uh, have empathy. Uh, there is no uh, clean architecture, uh, like rule for everything. It, it's very much about working together and, and having a uh, nice work-life balance also. So. <laughs> Uh, yes, we could say, I mean, psychological safety, I guess, as a um, uh, foundation, which is also something that, that there were many, I guess, uh, LinkedIn uh, discussions about the importance of uh, psychological safety, firstly, in a team and people caring about uh, quality and people willing to improve and they might not start with clean architecture, they might firstly start off with learning even solid principles or might start off with applying just dependency injection to get you know the outer layer for hexagonal uh, architecture and then if people see any benefit or improvement then that might also be used as uh, motivation for incremental uh, improvement in the future yes uh, i would say build a foundation and those foundations kind of, uh, you have to choose what to introduce to the squad, create an environment that is safe to ask, safe to learn. And uh, it's low and steady, it's better than uh, fast and, and broken. I think it's, you want to have a, a nice environment. Yes, yes, definitely. So yeah, I just want to say uh, thanks a lot for sharing your experiences, especially since you and your work as an engineering manager uh, have to you know, uh, deal not only with technical challenges and quality, but also uh, teams and, and uh, motivation and other aspects. So I think that this was really valuable how you shared your um, experience here. And additionally, it would also be great for, for people to look at um, the GitHub template that you made for uh, clean architecture. And we also have links in the description so that people can uh, connect with you and follow your uh, content. So I just want to say uh, excellent presentation uh, and th thanks a lot for, for this session today. Thank, thank you, Valentina, and uh, thanks to this uh, amazing uh, group. I, I think it's so nice to, to find uh, like-minded uh, developers, and uh, it's really inspiring all the insights uh, that you have been uh, putting together. Uh, you're also a great, great, great uh, developer. So, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Yeah, I think we had some great uh, questions today. So thanks a lot, everyone, for, for the really great uh, discussion and all the best. So see you at the next meetup. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.